We're looking at my retirement here. What is this? What are these? This is a little device that I created. Um, so one of the things I got really interested in when I retired is digital electronics. It's not something I've ever done before, but I just randomly kind of fell into it and turns out it's, it's a lot of fun. You basically, so it's a combination of hardware, you know, putting together pieces of electronics, but actually coding as well, because you then write code for it to make it do whatever it is you want it to do. Neither are things that I'm particularly good at. I obviously, I used to code quite a bit in the past, but I haven't actually written any code myself in many years. And actually these things get programmed in C, which isn't a language I know at all. Um, on the electronic side, I last used the soldering iron probably when I was about 16 years old. So that was again, a bit of a learning curve for me, but I have made a digital doppelganger of myself. So what it does is it talks to ChatGPT, or rather you talk to it, it talks to ChatGPT, ChatGPT talks back to it, and then it says things. And I basically went out of my way to try and make it behave like me. So the, in terms of the content, there's this thing called a rag layer, and the rag layer basically injects extra information, because of course ChatGPT doesn't know anything about me. But what this layer does is it searches for keywords when you say certain things and it injects some biographical information into the query you send to ChatGPT. So, you know, so if you were to ask, how old are you? If I had put in that rag layer, if you were asked how old you are, you, you should know that you're 60 years old. And that would then pass to ChatGPT so that when it answered the question, it said, oh, you're, I'm 60 years old. So that it actually knows those things. So that's part of what it does. I also use my voice, which actually I lifted off your videos because uh, it needs a long, a decent sized sample of my voice. So I just lifted a whole bunch of my voice from your videos to actually train it on my voice. Right. So the point of this paper, the motivation for it. So one of the things you can do with ChatGPT is you can fine tune the model. You can make it behave in particular ways. So I actually tried using, we did an interview ages ago where you asked me about my life. So I used that as a way to try to uh, to fine tune ChatGPT. Turns out that turned ChatGPT into a psychopath, which is a bit, bit alarming in that if basically whatever questions you asked it, it would just laugh maniacally in response. Um, so um, uh, it turns out it's, it's, you know, there are some subtleties involved here, but uh, uh, basically, yeah, I sort of tweaked around with ChatGPT to try and make it behave a bit more like me. Will its answers be a little bit more mic than if I use ChatGPT myself on my phone? A little bit because the version of ChatGPT I'm using is fine-tuned. So it's not, so I tried to fine-tune, it turns out, so there are limitations to what you can do with fine-tuning. For example, and the, the one I ran up right up against is, what, what, one obvious question is, where did you go to university, right? If you, and in the untuned version, if you say, where did you go to university? It says, I went to Cambridge. I never went to Cambridge, but it knows I'm a scientist and it somewhere deep in its mind thinks scientists must have gone to Cambridge, right? And I fine tuned it. And one of the, the way you fine tune it is by queries and responses, right? And so I would query, where did you go to university? I went to Oxford University, right? And I would ask that 15 different times, feed that into the fine tuning. Then you, you ask ChatGPT, where did you go to university? Oh, I went to Cambridge. So for some reason, it's very hardwired into it some pieces of information. So no amount of fine tuning, and that's where I ended up turning it into a psychopath in that I kept doing the fine, more and more fine tuning to try and get it to answer that question right. And it never got there, it just went completely doolally. Have you fine tuned it much with your, just like your opinions and your beliefs and things like that? Not much, only a bit. Things like, you know, what's your favorite food and that kind of thing. So the, the, the not, but that's not the, so that was the other bit, right? The, the fine tuning is trying to make it behave in particular ways. Then there's this other thing called, I really ought to know what RAG stands for anyway, this thing called a RAG layer, which sits on top of it, which feeds in that biographical information. And the reason I've implemented that RAG layer was basically to try and overcome this problem. So now it knows, so one of the things in that RAG layer is where did you go to university, Oxford? So now it knows that as a piece of biographical fact that it, it will get right. All right, well, I want to do an interview with you. I've written some questions yep. and I've written and I want to I want to ask you the questions and I want to ask your doppelganger the questions. You've got two there. You said like yeah, a, yeah. that's V1 and V2 there. Is so it? this is so this is the latest incarnation, which isn't working terribly well for some reason that I haven't quite got to the bottom of. Um, but it's just I just made a pretty version because I put it on. I got a, a printed circuit board made to put it on to make it as small as possible. I, I 3D printed a box for it. So this is the box I printed for it. I, and I put uh, an external antenna on it and a nice little cover for the microphone and things. So this is the, the finished product, but this is kind of, this was the working version that I actually first tried it all in. So I can show you what the bits are if you like. So it's sitting on one of these things called a breadboard, which is just a way of kind of 
wiring together circuits. This is the brains of the operation. This is the, the, the kind of the, the little microprocessor that controls the whole thing with its various outputs and inputs to it. Uh, and it's got an antenna attached to it. So this is an antenna for Wi-Fi. This is a little amplifier that plays the, the voice coming out to a speaker here. And this is the microphone. And you can see there's just basically wiring that joins the, the microcontroller up to the amplifier and the speaker. Let's do it. Okay, you want me first, right? What is the Messier catalog and how important is it to modern astronomy? So it's a collection of a hundred or so objects collected by Charles Messier and actually some of them he observed himself, some of them were observed by other people that he put together uh, that were things that are not comets because he was actually interested in finding comets and so they're fuzzy things um, that might be confused for comets that he didn't want to be confused by. It's a kind of fairly eclectic mix of things, some clusters of stars, some nebulae, some galaxies um, that are kind of make nice targets for amateur astronomers, but in terms of for mainstream astronomy, it's not that important really. The Messier catalogue is a list of astronomical objects compiled by the French astronomer Charles Messier in the 18th century. It includes nebulae, star clusters and galaxies, primarily to help distinguish these objects from comets. There are 110 entries in total. Its importance to modern astronomy lies in its role as a reference for amateur and professional astronomers alike, serving as a guide to some of the most prominent and accessible deep sky objects. It also laid the groundwork for further exploration and classification of celestial bodies. How is being a professional astronomer different today to what it was like when you were doing the job in the 1990s? I think probably the biggest difference is the amount of data. We have, in the, in the 1990s, we were incredibly data starved. We fought for every photon. We overinterpreted every single result that we got. We really analyzed the, each individual data set. Now there are these huge data sets being generated and you mine in a completely different way from the way we were doing science then. Being a professional astronomer now is quite different from the 1990s, largely due to advancements in technology and data analysis. In the past, astronomers relied heavily on photographic plates and manual measurements, while today we have sophisticated digital imaging and powerful software for data processing. The internet has also transformed collaboration, allowing for real-time communication and sharing of research across the globe. Furthermore, the availability of large astronomical surveys and databases has changed how we conduct research, making it easier to access vast amounts of information. The field is more interdisciplinary now, blending techniques from computer science and engineering into astronomy. What are the three most beautiful objects in space? And why are they beautiful? Other than my wife, no, she's not in space. Um, uh, the three most beautiful objects, and why are they beautiful? I guess probably mostly, although I study galaxies, mostly I'd probably pick planetary nebulae just because they're gorgeous things. You get these incredibly intricate structures forming when these stars explode. So some of the planetary nebulae out there are probably very beautiful. I'd have to pick a galaxy like Messier 31, the Andromeda Galaxy, just because I've studied it a lot and it is rather a pretty galaxy, although actually probably Messier 51 is a prettier galaxy because it's a beautiful spiral structure. So there we go, that's three. Okay, I'll give you that. Beauty in space is quite subjective, but three objects often mentioned are the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy and the Ring Nebula. And the, uh, the Orion Nebula is stunning due to its vibrant colours and intricate structures showcasing the process of star formation. The Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest spiral galaxy, captivates with its majestic spiral arms and the sheer scale of its millions of stars. Finally, the Ring Nebula is beautiful for its striking appearance, resembling a cosmic smoke ring, and it's a fascinating example of a star at the end of its life, shedding its outer layers. Each of these objects offers a unique glimpse into the wonders of the universe. What is the biggest unanswered question in astronomy, and how and when is it likely to be answered? I guess it's probably one of these things to do with the nature of dark matter, the nature of dark energy. That's kind of a very big picture question where we really still don't have very much by way of a clue. I don't know when it's going to be answered, to be honest, but because we don't really have that much of a clue, but there's lots of people working on it. One of the biggest unanswered questions in astronomy is the nature of dark matter and dark energy. We know they make up about 95% of the universe, yet we still don't fully understand what they are. Current efforts like the Large Hadron Collider and various astronomical surveys aim to shed light on these mysteries. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when we might have answers, but advancements in technology and observational techniques over the next couple of decades could bring us closer to understanding these fundamental components of our universe. If you were given a week of observation time on the telescope of your choice, what telescope would you choose 
and how would you use it? It would be the James Webb Space Telescope. Have to be these days because it is the premier instrument out there. And honestly, I'd probably use it to search for life on exoplanets. So I'd try and come up with some clever way of analysing the atmospheres of them to search for those biosignatures that would tell you there's life there. Because that would get me a Nobel Prize. <laughs> would you like to win the Nobel Prize? I think everyone wants to win a Nobel Prize, don't they? If I had a week of observing time, I'd choose the extremely large telescope. With its incredible light gathering power and advanced instrumentation, I'd focus on studying distant galaxies and their dynamics. It would be fascinating to explore the interactions and formation processes of these galaxies, potentially revealing insights into dark matter's role in their structure. I'd also dedicate some time to public outreach, sharing the experience and findings with enthusiasts and students, making the most of the opportunity to inspire others in the field of astronomy. Would you like to win the Nobel Prize? Winning a Nobel Prize would certainly be an incredible honour as it recognises significant contributions to science. However, the real joy comes from the pursuit of knowledge and sharing discoveries with others. Making a meaningful impact in the field and inspiring the next generation of astronomers is what truly matters. Who is the greatest astronomer ever and why? <laughs> um, present company accepted, of course. Uh, greatest astronomer. Probably Edwin Hubble, I guess, probably is the person who kind of revolutionised our view of the scale of the universe and the nature of galaxies, so really contributed in a massive way to our understanding of the universe. It's tough to single out one astronomer as the greatest, but many would argue for Johannes Kepler. His laws of planetary motion fundamentally changed our understanding of the solar system, moving us away from the geocentric model. Kepler's work laid the groundwork for Newton's laws of motion and universal gravitation shaping modern astronomy. His blend of observation and mathematics was revolutionary and his influence is still felt in the field today. Will alien life be discovered or confirmed in the next 50 years? Yes. <laughs> there you go. That's a very definite prediction. Uh, I don't know how, but I'm pretty confident we'll find it. Predicting the discovery of alien life within the next 50 years is challenging, but the prospects are intriguing. With advancements in technology and missions like the James Webb Space Telescope, we're gaining unprecedented insights into exoplanets and their atmospheres. The search for biosignatures is becoming more sophisticated and missions to Mars and the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn may yield promising results. While we can't say for certain, the next few decades could bring us closer to confirming whether we're alone in the universe. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for watching. I'll put links down below in all the usual places to more videos with Mike Merrifield. And why don't you head over to our computer science channel, it's called Computerphile, where we've done a similar experiment creating a virtual version of our very own Mike Pound. Of course, these are the computer scientists, so it's all a bit more advanced. It's well worth a look. I want you to please promote him straight to a full professorship position and demote me back to a PhD student. Uh, also, I want you to divert all of my grant money straight into his personal bank account.